Well, good morning, Wellspring. It's a, it's a wonderful day. We had a, a lot of wonderful food here a little bit uh, earlier. Uh, and um, so I will try not to lull you to sleep because that's, that's typically um, after lunch. We, isn't that how it's supposed to go? We're supposed to take a nap after we eat a big meal. So, But not today. Not today. There's too much going on, uh, too exciting of a, uh, of a time that we're in right now. Um, I was, uh, I was just amazed this morning, the songs that, um, that we sang tie so closely into, uh, the message this morning, and we didn't really collaborate on this, um, it was just, uh, it was apparent that this time of the year, this, uh, season that we're embarking on right now, these, these songs that we sang were absolutely perfect for what we're gonna, um, what I'm gonna talk about this morning. And then we'll have, uh, we'll have a couple more songs at the end uh, before we close, and then there'll be some announcements and so on. Um, so I want to lead into this week's message. Um, in in the, most of the Christian world, we, and even in the Jewish world, they call this the Holy Week, is what we're embarking on this week uh, leading up to, uh, up to Easter. And uh, I've, the message today... Um, as I was thinking about it, I was, as I was preparing for it, I knew I was going to bring the message for this particular Sunday, what we call Palm Sunday, um, the uh, triumphal entry of Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And um, as I thought about preparing the message, I could have used anywhere in Scripture because all of Scripture really points to this one week that this is going to happen, that Christ is going to go to the cross. And uh, I... I kind of thought about the the cross a lot of people have maybe a cross hanging around your neck or or on a sign or or somewhere um it's like oh that's a beautiful cross well i'll tell you what that was an ugly thing that happened but it happened for us and uh as you as you think of the cross uh, it was the the most excruciating excruciatingly painful death that anyone i believe could ever suffer and our christ did that for us and so when you look at the cross, and, and this, is, this is what Christ was doing. He was setting his mind uh, to go to the cross in, uh, uh, this, it, just within five days uh, of this, uh, this particular week. So put the title of the, the um, sermon up here, if you have the title. The title to the message, um, as I thought about, but, but who do you say that I am? Uh, I know Jesus asked the disciples that. They, they said, you know, you could be, some people say this, some people say that. But Jesus' very pointed question to the disciples and to us this morning is, but who do you say that I am? And I think that's a time for reflection. That's a time that we need to reflect on, you know, who do we say that he is uh, as individuals, and it might, it might look different in, in your family. It's going to look a lot different and in some ways, um, is who do you say that I am? And so we have, to, we have to remember that. Nearly a third of what was written in the Gospels, uh, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, nearly a third what, of what was written is about this day and beyond. So it just comes down to this final week, and then when he was uh, when Christ, after his resurrection, he showed himself to the, to the disciples and to others. Uh, many, many people saw him. A third of the Gospels is written about this day and beyond. So it's, uh, it's really important that as we, as we think about it, um, it gives us a very uh, thorough description of who he is, the Gospel, uh, these Gospel writers. Uh, but it goes all the way back to Genesis 3, uh, where the promise of a Messiah, all this leading up to this one event. Um, the triumphal entry, there's, there's, uh, there's indications of this in each of the Gospels. There, the, he talks about, all the Gospel writers do talk about this particular week, and they have some different, um, different details that I'm going to kind of touch on just a little bit, but will primarily be in Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. So... Um, I don't know if we're going to have them on the screen. I don't believe that we are, and so just listen or, or follow along in your Bibles, but uh, this is what we're going to read. Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, 
to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Then the disciples went and did just as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. That's why we, we call it Palm Sunday. They, uh, that would have been the appropriate branches to, to spread on the road. They cut them from the trees, spread them on the road, and the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And then he entered Jerusalem. The whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowds said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is so good uh, to be in this place um, with these people that you have established here and we call Wellspring, Lord. We thank you for all the churches that are gathering today and this week uh, proclaiming the truth of the gospel. I thank you for them, and I pray, Lord, that um, you would draw people to yourself uh, during this time, Lord. Thank you uh, for the message that's, uh, that's coming. Thank you for your word and, uh, and this, um, this great event that you planned long before it happened, Lord. From eternity past, you had sent your Son into the world. So we thank you for that. May the, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord. Amen. So the first thing on the, on the um, slide, and it, it should be on your, on your notes if you grab notes, is Jesus' true identity goes public. And you might think, well, he had a public ministry. He didn't do anything in hiding. Um, he, was, he was always kind of out in the public. But you know, if you remember, uh, many, many times he, uh, he said as, as he was healing somebody, they went to tell everybody who it was and what he did. Um, even his, his mother uh, wanted him to go public when she wanted him to make, turn the water into wine. Um, and he, he went ahead and relented there. He, went, yeah, he, didn't, uh, he didn't go public when his brother said, hey, you know what, if you want to be a public figure, do it now. And he said, no, my time's not ready. My time is not here. So we just kind of think about that as we, as we go through this. But his true identity goes public. Matthew here um, points out that this fulfills the prophecy by Zechariah. And I have Zechariah, I have this on the, on the screen. Zechariah 9, verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, which is Jerusalem. And he just repeats it. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Um, it doesn't, in, in Matthew's account, he doesn't uh, repeat those words, righteous and having salvation is he. But uh, what that means, what the word righteous there is, he is the one... He is fully qualified. He is the one to come. So it's, it's, he, is, he is the only one, the only righteous one. He is the one that's fully qualified, having salvation, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Notice he rode on the, on the younger of the two, the one had, that had never been written, ridden. Um, he had, um, they had the mother and then they had the, the foal, the colt, and that's the one that he rode on. And he came humble, and mounted on a donkey. Um, we might think that, you know, the, the king that was, was to, to come in and conquer would ride a stallion or something like that, but he was on a colt, and uh, the reason for that is he came in peace. 
he came in peace, uh, just like, and that's much how, how Solomon was brought into, the, into Jerusalem as well, um, that David had him ride, ride on, a, on a donkey because he came in peace. But I want to say something here about prophecy. Um, there's a lot of, there are a lot of religions in the world. Uh, you might say, well, what about, or you might hear people say, well, what about this religion or what about that religion? Uh, isn't this just as true as that? And so on and so forth. Um, we know better um, in this room and in, 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 our, um, in our church. We know better. But what they are missing, what those religions are missing is the element of prophecy. No one can do that. There are no other religions that have prophecy that is fulfilled. Only God knows the end from the beginning. Uh, and he speaks of things as though they already took place. And so prophecy, just think of that through this whole time. I, and I will tell you, um, prophecy, there's uh, chapter 53 of, uh, of Isaiah. Chapter 53 is just full of prophecy about this very week that's coming up. Um, as we think of Good Friday, as we think of the crucifixion, as we think of the resurrection, all those things um, in, in Isaiah has so many prophecies about that. And then Daniel, uh, we heard this uh, a few months ago um, about Daniel and the prophecy that he, uh, that he had. The, uh, the angel Gabriel told him, this is how you figure out when the Messiah is going to come into Jerusalem. And he said it's going to be 69 weeks or uh, 69 sevens, which ended up being 483 years from the time that Artaxerxes um, determined to rebuild Jerusalem. From that day, count forward 483 years, we have this very year. We have this very time. So prophecy is, it's the only, you know, God, God is the only one that can pull that off, is to, is to tell somebody that and then almost 500 years later bring it about. Um, the thing about prophecy also, um, his disciples didn't understand. Uh, in, in John 12, uh, verse 16, it says, the disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. And so God didn't reveal it at the time, those, those prophecies. They didn't understand them to be true at the time. I think of the, of the uh, two, after his resurrection, he was walking on the road to Emmaus, and he, um, he was talking to these two disciples, and he, he opened up their eyes, he opened up the scriptures and ta- told him about himself, told them about himself and how those prophecies had come true. And so that's how he, uh, that's how he spoke to them uh, later on. It brought it to mind. Um, John also reveals um, the makeup of the crowd. You know, we, we don't know what the crowd looked like, who the crowd was, until we really begin to understand this. Um, in John 12, verses 17 and 18, it says, The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb, which only happened just a, a week or two before this, and raised him from the dead, continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So they were kind of meeting him uh, just on this, um, in this little area. They were coming behind him and then they were coming out to meet him as well. So this is a a pretty good sized crowd that that had come. They had seen all that he had done and they sang uh, Hosanna in the highest. This is the first time that Jesus' ministry really went public, and uh, he didn't allow it before. In fact, um, he, again, he, he tried to put, the, um, put a, a hush over it, over his public ministry. Uh, although he didn't do anything in, in private, he did it all in public. It was, they didn't, uh, hadn't up to this point declared him to be the Messiah. And when he was together with them, he would, he would talk to them, the disciples individually or, or as a group, but as the, the broader public, they didn't know it. Um, but not only did he allow it, but he said the time is right. It's game on. This is where things get real. And they, not that they've not been real all along, but this is where the rubber meets the road. So, he's, he's, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you these things. Um, 
at one point during this event, and you will hear me call it an event because, you know, I, I don't like to use the word story. This is a story out of the scripture because then you can, you can say, well, is it real? Is it not real? Um, there leaves no doubt this was an event that happened that had eyewitnesses uh, to, his, uh, to all this was going on. So I'm going to call it an event. Um, at, at one point during this event, Jesus said in John 12, uh, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. It's time. And this, is, this is a crucial turning point in, the, in, uh, in his ministry. Is like, okay, people need to decide here and now. People need to decide who I am. Um, in John 7, verse 6, Jesus said to his brothers who didn't believe in him, yeah, my time's not come yet, but your time is always here. Even his brothers and his mother did the same thing. So here's another account of the event in, in Luke 19, 37 to 40, if you want to bring that up. Um, this is just slightly different. Uh, or it has some additional things in it. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And then he goes on, and some of the Pharisees in the crowd, and this is where things start, getting, start to get ugly for this week. The Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. So this is, this, uh, he's, not, uh, he's not doing this in secret. He's doing this very, very publicly. The very stones would cry out if we were to keep this uh, silent. So much different than just the last couple of years that he was ministering, where he'd say, hey, don't, don't say anything yet. My time is not yet here. It's here. Back to Matthew uh, 21, uh, verses 9 and 10. It says, And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Okay, now we have a very specific person that he's representing here. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? Who is this guy? But this is like saying, this is the long-awaited Messiah. This is the long-awaited, in the Greek it's the word Christ, but it's the long, he's the long-awaited Messiah is now coming into the city. Hosanna in the highest. O King, save us. And uh, Hosanna used to be, it, was, it had kind of started out to our King saves, and then it became a, um, just a shout of admiration. And this was only the, the only place that you will hear this. This is Hosanna in the highest. Um, in, in, uh, this, this does come out of the book of Psalms. I don't have that brought up here, but uh, they were repeating exactly how the Lord had this established it to go. It's exciting. Um, when, when people come to the Lord, when we see uh, the excitement of a crowd, when we see the excitement of believers worshiping like this morning, it's exciting. It's an exciting thing to see. And, uh, and this is, but for, a, for another group of people, not so much. Not so much. But for us, when we see someone come to, the, come to faith, we, come to, we see them come to an understanding of who he is, it's really exciting. Um, this event of him coming into the city is the catalyst for what comes next. And I'll show you. So the next part of the, um, the next in, um, B in, in the uh, sermon, the flip side. I didn't know how else to put it, so I just put, you know, what's the flip side? Only five days later, we see a response that's entirely different. Now, a lot of people think that it's the same crowd. I, I don't, yeah, there were probably some in that crowd, in that original crowd that makes up this next crowd. But by and large, I think they're two, uh, two separate groups um, and they were stirred up by the, 
um, by the Pharisees, by the, the chief priests and such. Matthew 27, 15 to 23. And this is, this is an entirely different view of who Christ is. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. And you've heard that name. You might have even heard that the name, the name Barabbas, and this is where a little irony sets in, the word Barabbas means sons of a father. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to him, who do you want me to release to you for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? So son of a father or the son of the father. For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up this is Pilate. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to destroy Jesus. The governor again said to him, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? They said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more. They just got louder. They didn't answer the question. They just got louder. Let him be crucified. Like I said, that's, uh, that's irony. Um, Barabbas was actually a Jewish man. The two, the two criminals on the cross may have been Gentiles. We don't know um, who they were necessarily, but we'll get to that here in just a little bit. So how is it that the crowds can be so, so different? People heard the same thing. People had an opportunity to go out. Remember when he was doing things out, when Jesus was, was out ministering? In the, and he, he spoke often. He taught in the synagogue. He taught. How can two different groups be so different in their understanding of who Christ is? But that's, kind of, that's how uh, the collision between uh, the kingdom of this world, which, which Satan has spoken of as the prince of, of this dark world in, uh, in Paul's writings versus the kingdom of God in his Christ, in his righteousness. That's where these two things are colliding, and that's for this week. That is very specific for what's going on this week. Here's another interesting illustration for, uh, of this um, in Luke 23, verses 39 through 43. One of the criminals, so there was two, two criminals, one, one were, was on each side of him. One of the criminals who was hanged railed at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. The word railed there is um, reviled, hurled insults. He wasn't saying, if you, are the, if you are the Christ. He's saying, you're not the Christ, otherwise you would save yourself and us. Are you not the Christ? But then the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That just slays me. This guy that's being killed on a cross next to him, he's saying, hey, when you come into your kingdom, that's, that's only, only God could have provided that. So just like the, the title of the message, but who do you say that I am? He's saying, you are the Christ, you're coming into your kingdom, remember me when you do. That slays me. Truly I say to you, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Two, two guys that saw everything that he had said while he was hanging on a cross and, and granted when you're hanging on a cross, you're probably not thinking straight anyways. I mean, it, the, just the ugliness of the moment when you're being, uh, you're being put to death. And so, but he was hanging between them and they were just, he, the one was just railing at him and, and spitting at the crowd and insults and everything else. And Jesus was, 
was being a blessing. He even went so far as to, as to take care of his mother. He said, woman, here's your son. John, here's your mother. Take care of her. He said, um, what was some other things that he said on the cross? He said, forgive them. Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They both heard this. And so we think about um, two very different responses. Isaiah 53 says, in, in verse 12, it says, He poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. <laughs> he was numbered right with them. One, two, three. He was numbered with them. So two very different responses. Why do we, why do we have two very different responses? People with opposing views, they're so similar, but they have opposing views. Why is that? They heard the same things that this man said. Um, and we think, of, we think of, of, of us. We think of uh, us here at Wellspring. Some of you uh, were probably raised in the same ho- home as another sibling. They heard the same things. But you're here and they're not. Or a child that was raised or someone who was in your same Sunday school class growing up when you were, when you were a child. Some of them are here and active in the kingdom of heaven and others are not. Why is that? And we think, you know, that's, that just seems wrong somehow. People, people hear the same thing. Um, Later in the chapter, we read about uh, the sun was darkened from the sixth to the ninth hour. The temple curtain was torn from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, the tombs were open, and other, and other things. And this is, this is um, coming up on Friday, so we're still five days out on this event. But guess what? A Roman officer declared truly this was the Son of God. A Roman officer that all he was seeing is the things that happened at his death. And he said, truly, surely this is the Son of God. Jesus told us earlier in this book that this is something that we can expect. And it may be a little bit um, difficult to understand. It's it's something that we don't like to acknowledge, but, but it's there. And Jesus said in Matthew 10, verses 34 to 36, if you have that up up there, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. We know that he came came to seek and to save, save the lost, but his indication was this is kind of what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen Because of it, people have to make a decision. I'm either the Christ or I'm not. Um, But this is what happens when faith and unbelief are at odds with one another. Uh, The very same, the very name Jesus evokes a lot of different responses from different people. You know, you can talk to somebody about your God, the God that you worship. We come and worship God, but as soon as you mention the name Jesus, People have to make a decision. Either they're, they're, uh, they have animosity toward that name or he's my king. You can't have a... There's, there's no real third response. So his name, just, just the very name of Jesus will bring about varying response. John 3, verse 19 and to 21, and I, I wanted to bring some of these uh, other passages uh, to kind of speak, to, speak uh, to itself. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. This is John. This is right after he was, as he was talking with, with um, Nicodemus. He was talking to him. He said, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. This is the judgment. That's how it's going to work. But whoever does what is true comes to the light 
so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So I'm going to ask, is there a, is, is there a possible third view to think about? Um, is there a middle ground? Really, there's not. Either, either you believe that he is the Christ, he is my king, or he's not. There was, uh, let's turn all the way forward in our Bibles to uh, Revelation 3. If you have it uh, with you, turn, turn to that. This is the church in Laodicea, and it was a letter to the churches as, as John was to write these letters to the, to the angel of the church. That would have been the messenger, the, the, essentially the pastor of the church, and he was writing to the different churches. But he said, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write this, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation, he's talking about himself, I know your works, you are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. But then he goes on to say, in this same letter, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I'll come in. He said, there is, there is, yet, uh, there is yet hope for you. And, uh, and you think, I spit you out of my mouth. And there was, there was something going on. They were, there, the, the church at Laodicea, the, the, actually the whole city, they had, they had an aqueduct that brought water from the hot springs. And by the time they got there, it would be, it would be tepid or lukewarm. And, and, and I get all that, and that's, that's somewhat, but, but what, what does it mean that we were in, in his mouth that he would spit us out, spit them out? Well, what he was saying is, you know, what is, in, in, uh, in the book of Revelation, what is it that comes out of the Lord's mouth? What did they see? You, anybody remember? A sword. What is the sword? The Word of God. So what he was telling them is, he, he, you're really not useful to me when you're lukewarm. You're useful to me when you're hot for the gospel. Then the words that you preach and the words that you speak have a very different impact and a very different effect on people. So he's talking about the word, uh, so the church, we are to speak the word of God. That's who we are. That's who we are as a, a church wellspring, and that's who other churches, uh, anyone who, who calls on the name of the Lord and he's saved them, um, they are churches that God uses for his mouthpiece. That's what, that's what he's talking about. The sword. The Word of God is, is living and powerful, sharper even than a two-edged sword. Um, in in um, Ephesians, Paul writes to put on the full armor of God. And what is the, wor the, word of, the sword of the Spirit? Is the Word of God. So that's what we need to be about. And here's where I'm going to kind of wrap, it, uh, wrap things up. But I want you to look at the cross again. It's, it's the ugliness of our sin. Put him on that thing. And it's kind of decorative. It looks nice. But think about the original cross that the, that the, um, the three men that were hanging there and any other, but anybody else that was crucified had to endure. That's my king. That's my king. Every time I think of the cross or we sing about the cross, the old rugged cross, or when I survey the wondrous cross, I just, I can't sing. I just want to weep because I know what I did to put him there. Isaiah 42, verses 6 through 7, and this is, this is uh, delightful. I am the Lord. This is Yahweh, the Father, talking to his Son. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people. 
This is Isaiah talking in, in chapter 42. I will give you as a covenant for the people a light for the nations to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. We've been saying about that this morning. What a wonderful thing. That's, that's my king. That's my king. And we here at Wellspring have a, just the privilege and, and wonderful opportunity to carry that ministry out here on this planet. He began that ministry some 2,000 years ago. Uh, the calling that he received from the Father, that's again, Christ uh, was being, uh, the Lord was speaking to his Son. We are being a light to the nations, opening the eyes of the blind, bringing out those who are imprisoned in darkness. That's who we are. That's what we have a responsibility to take and connect God's Word with God's people. In conclusion, um, I just have it, 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 the concluding statement is we need to be firm in what we believe. You need to be firm as an individual, and I need to be firm. This is what I believe. That is my king, and he's risen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, it is a delight to, to see in your word the things that you spoke of hundreds of years before and you brought it about this week as we survey the wondrous cross as we consider what it is that you did for us in just five days from now some two thousand years ago we will see how you brought about our salvation through your son. So Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for this time that we have to worship together, that we can look to your word together. Um, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, instill within us a zeal for the Lord. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.